The Tom Woods Show, episode 1755. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. I've got a couple of unrelated things I want to talk about today. i got a microphone, a podcast, and here I go talking about them. One of them has to do with the virus and one of them has to do with the Tuttle Twins book series, which is a libertarian book series for younger people, because it was the subject of a massive attack in, I think it's Current Affairs? Let me check. Current Affairs, which is a kind of establishment publication, very boring. You know every single word they're going to say, so it's not uh, anything that we should be surprised at, except for, I don't know, the fact that it happened shows that the Tuttle Twins series is doing very well. I talked to the creator of that series, Connor Boyack, at the Mises Institute's event last weekend, and the books are just flying off the shelves at this point, thousands and thousands per day that I think are very, very helpful for younger people. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. I want to start with just a, a couple of quick things about Sweden and the virus. Now, you may be tired of hearing about Sweden, but doggone it, we got to talk about Sweden because the point of this whole thing is that Sweden has been a kind of control group. And I remember saying from the beginning that it's, it's fantastic that we have this control group because otherwise the, you know, the lizard people would be able to claim that all the good results that have been accomplished around the world came about because of their mitigation measures, so-called. But there's that example of Sweden staring them in the face. So they have had to try to discredit Sweden. They've hysterically shouted at Sweden all along, month after month after month. We were told by Neil Ferguson, the guy who, you remember, the guy whose exaggerated death counts were almost immediately jumped on by actual scientists who said, this is ridiculous, and there's no reason we should be listening to this, but we keep listening to this guy. And his model was predicting 96,000 deaths in Sweden. By June, it was 4,000. It was 96,000 if they didn't lock down. Well, they didn't lock down. They did not close businesses. They did not close schools for ages 1 to 15. And they did not have a mask mandate. These things can't be gotten around. Yes, they limited uh, gatherings for some time. And they had measures that people followed um, more or less voluntarily. But if you look at pictures from Stockholm, it's pretty obvious how normal life was and how normal life continues to be. Now it's becoming sort of common on Twitter to run into people visiting Sweden who are posting videos onto Twitter about just how normal life is so that we don't get propagandized into thinking that Sweden too is dealing with a lot of suffering and deprivation. Sweden is just going on with life. You you look around restaurants, public transit everywhere, no masks, no masks, no obvious social distancing that I can see. And they're down to zero to one death per day. And that's where they are. So this has been hard for the lockdowners and the anti-life people to cope with. And they've had a number of different excuses that they've come up with to try to explain Sweden away. Instead of just saying like normal, humble people, we don't really know what's going on here, but apparently Sweden shows that we could have done it this way which is the obvious answer. And I've been saying for months that I'm not claiming I have all the answers. I'm just saying that this virus does not seem to act like the virus that kids learn about in chapter two of Introduction to Epidemiology. It clearly does not because they're predicting uh, exponential growth. And don't you know what exponential growth is and talking to you like you're 10 and they've been predicting this disaster and that disaster that did not happen or spikes that would lead to catastrophic results that led to at most moderate results and then fizzled out somehow. And they have no real explanation for this. So with Sweden, for the first thing was that their death rate was high. Now I've covered this before, so I'm getting to some new material in a minute. So we've talked about that. Their death rate is nowhere, you know, it's, it's better than a lot of the lockdown countries, that's for sure. And most of it is because of people in long-term care facilities, which they, they managed badly. But just like with any other country, the average 
You know, we're talking about people dying when they're 80, pretty much, in Sweden. But now there are other excuses they've made also. And one is Sweden doesn't have the population density of some of our population centers, and that explains it. But the problem with that is nobody was saying that at the time, okay? Nobody was saying in April, well, don't worry, everybody, even if Sweden doesn't lock down, it's not going to hit them that hard because they're not as densely populated as some other places. No one said that. Everybody said Sweden is just going to be a giant graveyard. Not one person said, oh, you don't really have anything to worry about in Sweden. So that's obviously an after-the-fact excuse. Ask any of these people who were saying, oh, that's because Sweden had lower population density. How many of them were saying that in April? Okay, answer is zero. So these are not people who are just uh, interested in what science has to say and they're going to adjust their views accordingly. No, they're going to adjust their excuses in order to justify their original views. Not one of these people was urging us not to worry about Sweden because it has low population density. (laughs) Not one. Only when Sweden embarrassed them did they have to go back and say, well, how can I explain this? Instead of saying, maybe there's a hole in my theory. You know, maybe this virus doesn't act exactly the way I thought it did. Or maybe the the measures we're taking against it are not as effectual as I thought or not as necessary. Never. They don't have a scientific frame of mind. So that thought does not occur to them. It's let me go figure out what possible excuse I could make, even though it's nothing like anything I was saying back in April. So that's one thing. Then another one is that Sweden is doing a lot of social distancing voluntarily. And, you know, you stupid rubes in America would never do that. You need the the iron fist of the law behind it. But they were just doing it voluntarily. And so that explains why they're doing well. Now, so again, notice that now they have to admit Sweden is kind of doing well. And now they have to account for why it's doing well. And so they go back and say, well, maybe it's that they tried our wacko voodoo measures without the force of government behind them. That must be it. But the thing is, thanks to thanks to Google mobility data, we actually know whether they did this or not. We actually know how much people interacted with each other and how mobile they were and whether they really stayed home and all that. We, we can measure this. So you can come up with your crazy theories that you think will distract us from how wrong you were about Sweden. But the thing is, we can check them. That's the problem with that. And our old friend Elgato Malo, the pseudonymous fellow on Twitter, uh, just just ran the numbers uh, using what he calls Google Mobility Social Interaction Score. So it's an average of retail slash restaurant, grocery, parks, workplace, public transit. How much are people moving around and interacting with people? And at the peak of people's behavior adjustment in Sweden, there was a 9% drop in the Google Mobility Social Interaction Score. By comparison, in the U.S., there was a 37% drop. In France, a 69% drop. And in Spain, a 75% drop. So it's simply false. I don't know if we want to say it's a lie. I don't think the people saying this are smart enough to know the truth, to be lying, actually. But there you go. You can verify this. The numbers are there there was a very modest behavioral adjustment, not nearly to the point where you could say, well, that must explain a 9% change. If the, if the virus is that mild that a 9% behavioral change leads to zero deaths, then we should all be making 9% behavioral changes. So that didn't work. So then the other thing is their economy didn't do well. You know, other countries' economies are doing better. Because, of course, the way for your economy to do well is to shut businesses down for arbitrary lengths of time and shackle them with crazy restrictions that obviously have nothing to do with science, so-called. That's supposed to be what makes your economy do well. I mean, the, the very fact that you would even think that Sweden would do badly because it allowed commerce to continue is just so bizarre. It's so strange. But of course, speaking of numbers, well, with, ec- with economics, we have plenty of numbers. And the numbers here are in the second quarter of 2020, compared to the second quarter of 2019, the Swedish GDP dropped by 8.3%. But in the US, it was 9.5%, 11.7% in Germany, 13.5% in Canada, 
21.7% in Britain and 22.1% in Spain. So for the the whole year, for 2020 as a whole, a new paper reveals that Sweden is expected to see a contraction of 3.3%, and that's compared to the U.S.'s 4.3%, the U.K. 5.8%, and the Eurozone 8.3%. So don't worry about the Swedish economy. They're doing okay. Now, incidentally, I feel fairly certain that Stockholm has reasonable population density, that that city in particular, compared to plenty of other European cities. So I think even this is overblown. But the fact that they're coming back with, oh, it's a totally different kind of place. They, they said the same thing with Georgia. When Georgia reopened, I'm talking about the, the U.S. state. When Georgia reopened, we got all these apocalyptic predictions. Georgia is running an experiment in human sacrifice. Georgia is trying to become the um, number one death destination in the United States. I mean, these were actual headlines in the Washington Post and the Atlantic. And then when that did not pan out at all, and you would say, well, look, New York did so much worse. Why are you even bothering to talk about Georgia? It's not even worth talking about. And they would come back with, oh, well, they're just totally different places. You know, of course, Georgia is going to do better. Okay, but you weren't saying that at the time. When Georgia opened, nobody was saying, Oh, listen, everybody, don't worry. Georgia is totally different from New York. So Georgia's going to have a much better result. No, they were saying Georgia's going to become the number one death destination. And then when that didn't happen, instead of saying, gee, maybe I might have been wrong, maybe I'm looking at this the wrong way, they come up with excuses, saying things they were not saying at the time. That is not honorable. Hey, everybody, let's take a quick break to thank our sponsor, Policy Genius. And that means we need to talk about something that you know you need to take care of. You know you've been meaning to do it, but maybe you haven't yet. And it is urgent. That, of course, is life insurance. It's Halloween this month. Policy Genius wants to mark the occasion by making life insurance less scary. Right now, you could save 50% or more by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance. First, Head to policygenius.com, and in minutes, you'll be working out how much coverage you need and comparing quotes from top insurers to find your best price. As a matter of fact, Policy Genius will be comparing policies that start at as little as a dollar a day. You might even be able to skip the in-person medical exam. And the best part is Policy Genius works for you, not the insurance company. So if you hit any speed bumps during the application process, they will take care of everything. And that's the kind of service that's earned Policy Genius a five star rating across over 1,600 reviews on Trustpilot and Google. So if you need life insurance, and you do, head to policygenius.com right now to get started. You could save 50% or more by comparing quotes. Policy Genius, when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. All right, let's switch gears over here now. Two completely different topics for our episode. I'll link to the, well, first of all, I'm going to link to an article on Sweden that has those economic numbers. So I'll put that up at tomwoods.com slash 1755. The other thing I'm going to put up is this article in Current Affairs. And man, they don't like the Tuttle Twins series. The idea of the Tuttle Twins is it's a beautifully illustrated, very colorful children's book series with, I guess, 11 titles in it at the moment. And the idea is that in each one of these children's books, themes in a classic libertarian volume are explored. So, for example, the very first one, I I believe, is the one on the Tuttle Twins and the law. Well, the law is not just the abstract concept of the law. It's actually a reference to Frederick Bastiat's little book, The Law. And the themes in that book, like legal plunder, that you may know if you've read that book, are then explored at a children's level over the course of the book. But then, of course, there are other ones. Uh, there's, uh, there's one on the golden rule, and that even talks about foreign policy in there, about, you know, not, you know, about treating people the way you'd want to be treated. There's, there's one, The Creature from Jekyll Island, which is a book on the Federal Reserve, and so it talks about stuff like that. There's one about the pencil, the miraculous pencil, and that, of course, is drawn from the great Leonard Reed essay, I Pencil, which points out, well, I'll get to the pencil thing in a, in a minute, but the point is you see the idea behind the, the series. And yes, it's true that you are conveying to children libertarian ideas, but think of it this way. I mean, in case that for some reason makes you uncomfortable, there's no reason it should, by the way, no reason it should. You don't raise your kids not to believe in anything. You don't raise them to believe that it's just an arbitrary imposition on them that they can't murder their friends. 
you would teach them that it's actually wrong for them to murder their friends, right? Where it's not just some arbitrary convention that our society has adopted, but could just as easily have adopted the opposite. You don't say that. You don't say, you know, we, we could live in a society where we do murder each other, but we flipped a coin and went with no murder. We don't say that. We teach them that there are, are such things as right and wrong. If they go and grab something that belongs to somebody else, we don't say, you know, property rights are an artificial convention that we've adopted in our society that could just as easily be the opposite of what they are. We don't say that. We tell our kids that's wrong. So what are we teaching our kids from birth, basically, we're teaching them that they shouldn't steal and they shouldn't use physical force against people. So the Tuttle Twins series is simply reinforcing moral ideals that we're already teaching anyway, but it reinforces them in particularly memorable ways and in ways that will, as they get exposed to the 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week propaganda machine of media and entertainment and academia, well, they'll have some kind of foundation to be able to think for themselves as opposed to being absorbed into the Borg. So a fellow named Rob Larson writes an article called The Tuttle Twins and the Case of the Really Bad Libertarian Propaganda. And the subtitle is The Right Gets Them While They're Young. And that's just rich, right? The left, meanwhile, innocently presents children with both sides of every conceivable argument, right? <laughs> right? That's what the left is known for, not for shutting people down or refusing to acknowledge the existence of competing arguments or intimidating people into silence or making people feel like they can't say what they want to say. No, the left isn't known for that at all. They're just known for impartially presenting both sides of a case, right? Whereas it's the right wing, quote unquote, that gets them while they're young. You have to be kidding me. If if that were true, he wouldn't have been able to write this article because there would be books everywhere, courses everywhere, propaganda everywhere that he could have written about. The very fact that he can isolate just one book series kind of shows how lopsided the situation is. I can look at children's books coming from a left-wing perspective all over the place, absolutely everywhere. Now, I don't want to go through the whole article because there's no point. You already know what it's going to say. You already know the kinds of criticisms he'll have. I thought it was funny that in his critique, such as it is, of the first book in the series, The Tuttle Twins Learn About the Law, that he, you know, he comments on the bookshelf that's evident behind their neighbor Fred in their neighbor Fred's uh, house in his home library. It says this this library has many recognizable libertarian titles from Murray Rothbard to Ron Paul's and the Fed to, and then this I love, somehow, Jeremy Scahill's Dirty Wars. Somehow. Isn't that funny? And how, how revealing that word somehow is. Because I bet if I went to Rob Larson's bookshelf, it wouldn't have a diversity of titles on it. Like a surprising book. To him, it's surprising that there'd be a book by somebody on the left on that shelf. That's surprising. Because I'm sure in his private life, that would be surprising to see anything other than things he agrees with 100%. I'm sure that is surprising. That's why he puts in that somehow. But it's not a somehow. It's a we learn from anybody who has anything to teach us. And there are some areas where people who aren't in agreement with us 100% are very, very good and we can learn from. So I don't know why that would be a somehow. He obviously doesn't know us very well. Then he's upset that Connor, Connor Boyack, who writes the books, isn't distinguishing in classic Marxist fashion between personal property and private property. You know, so it's okay for you to own your own matchbox car and you know, to own your own knife and fork or something, but that's totally different from owning a factory, man. And see, this is the kind of stuff that you have to buy into when you're not a libertarian. So as a libertarian, we just believe that Property is property, and it's acquired through certain consistent principled means that you can homestead something that's, that's previously unowned and acquire it that way. You can acquire something by buying it from somebody, so a voluntary transaction. You can acquire it when it is given to you as a gift. And there's no reason that this suddenly doesn't hold when we're dealing with a building rather than a bunch of spoons. There's no reason that that's just an arbitrary distinction that's made by people who really, really, really want to tax that building and what goes on in it. 
and they really, really want a share of the proceeds in there. So they have to invent a series of reasons that that property really isn't the same as the spoons. It's totally different, man, totally different. But it's acquired using exactly the same three possible ways. So what is going on here other than some kind of grandiose rationalization of greed, of, of a desire to grab hold of the proceeds of that property? So no, Connor does not distinguish between those things because he shouldn't. I would need an entire episode, and maybe I'll do one actually, because I haven't covered this in a long time, to deal with his objections about the welfare state, Rob Larson. You'll never guess he's in favor. You'll never guess he has the conventional opinion on that. So uh, maybe I'll try and get back to that. I've, I've done some material on this, and I've written a bit about it in uh, The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History when talking about the Great Society programs of the 1960s. But that really is an entire other episode. He's very unhappy that a couple of the characters over the course of the 11 book series happen to be black. And don't we know that most black people are not libertarians? Well, neither are most white people, as that turns out. Neither are most people, okay? But boy, is he unhappy. He says, something about the white white Utah authors having his far right words come from the mouth of a working class woman of color is, shall we say, distasteful. <laughs> so, so he repeats the word white twice, right? And then he can't believe that the person of color in the book would say anything other than something I approve of and says anything other than what I think people of color should be saying. Okay, Rob Larson, you seem like a fun guy. He can't understand why Connor and the Tuttle Twins book series are very unhappy about central planning, but it always means government planning, and they're not unhappy about, let's say, Amazon's central planning or some big corporation's central planning. So he doesn't know what the term central planning means. Does he actually think libertarians are against businesses planning? We all have plans. Businesses have plans. I have plans. You have plans. We're not against plans per se. Again, when you don't bother to read us, you come up with crazy interpretations of what we say. We're not against planning. We're against society-wide planning. As big as Amazon is, it's not all of society. Central planning is when you try to direct the allocation of resources and including labor in an entire society. Yeah, we're against that. Number one, because of the rights violations involved. But number two, because the central planning board has to be arbitrary in doing that. They don't have access to the prices that they would need in order to make rational judgments there. Whereas a private business does have access to that and is calculating based on profit and loss. Because profit and loss is the feedback that we as society give them as to whether they're allocating resources in line with our preferences. Government has no such feedback. How would it? So there are a lot of reasons that we make that distinction, and he just professes not to understand it. Okay, but he could have asked me, and I could have explained it to him in this 90 seconds. And then the author takes a swipe at Elijah Stanfield, who is the extremely talented artist. You know that the visuals in the book are very good when a hate-filled author like this even has to say, the Tuttle Twins books have reasonably appealing watercolor illustrations. Okay, he ha if, when he says that, that means they're beautiful. <laughs> okay, when somebody that full of hate has to say that, that means that the illustrations are beautiful. But he says, the artist produced campaign videos for Ron Paul's 2012 presidential candidacy in case you were thinking of letting him off the hook. That's, oh yeah, of course, we can't let him off the hook for that because you know we can't have people supporting dissident voices. You know, we, we all have to kind of rally around the Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden center. And we can, you know, from time to time, we can allow a Mitt Romney in there, a John McCain. You know, it doesn't matter how many wars they support because we really don't care about that. We just want left centrist kind of uh, mainstream. That's what we want. So we can't have people being really against war. Like, you know, every once in a while when a war goes wrong, we'll kind of admit that that was a mistake. But we can't have principled voices against war. Because uh, that might raise questions about the whole nature of the regime. We don't want those questions raised, right? We don't, because as you can see, we don't want kids entertaining unapproved thoughts. We certainly don't want adults contemplating the nature of the regime. That's not going to happen. We can't have somebody who predicted, and not just because he fell ass backwards into it, but 
to a T exactly what was going to happen in the 2008 crisis. He predicted it all in a, in a speech on the House floor in 2001, saying that the Fed was replacing the dot-com bubble with a real estate bubble and that that was going to lead to a lot of problems. We can't have that. What, what instead we need are politicians who blame it all on banker greed or who didn't see it coming or whatever. That's what we need. You know, we'd rather have those people. And we can't have, it's just so, you know, we get Ron Paul who's willing to go down to South Carolina on a South Carolina debate stage and say, yeah, I would legalize heroin. Yeah, I would. And go down to Florida where the Cuban community probably disagrees with him and say, I think we should have free trade with Cuba. We absolutely can't have that. Don't let this guy off the hook because he illustrated for a guy like this. Instead, we need people who repeat focus grouped slogans over and over to whatever audience they're standing before. Well, what a world that would be. Imagine that world. That's the world this guy lives in, where kids get indoctrinated, in his view, in all the correct, socially acceptable opinions, where there's no, there are no dissident voices. And when occasionally a dissident comes along, we criticize him using arguments that really shouldn't satisfy a third grader, which is what I read in this column here. It's like, doesn't he know there's a difference between this kind of property and that? Well, maybe not, because you haven't justified it. You've just asserted it. Or why isn't he against this kind of central planning? Because that's not what central planning is. That is literally not the definition of central planning. So these are all pretty weak arguments. So what I recommend you do, of course, is go get the Tuttle Twins books for your kids. I mean, I don't know, maybe ages like 6 to 12, maybe. I'm not exactly sure what the age range is. I mean, they could be even younger because the pictures are so... Uh, so nice that any kid, a young person, even not able to read or even to fully understand the themes that are raised there could could appreciate the illustrations without a doubt. So you can go grab them, as I highly recommend, at tomwoods.com slash twins. And you will be happy with your purchase. I feel sure of it. Connor has some really exciting plans in the works. Uh, he's got a uh, an animated series. It's It's... I'm so glad he's he's doing so well. It's just the Tuttle Twins franchise is doing fantastically well. Every year, it just explodes further. And I could not be happier for him. And the fact that he got attacked in this article goes to show that he's making an impact and getting noticed. So for that, we can be grateful. So check out tomwoods.com slash 1755 if you want to take a look at that article. Also, the Sweden article I mentioned and uh, pick up the books, tomwoods.com slash twins. Now, if you like and appreciate what I'm doing, I would be delighted to welcome you as a supporting listener of The Tom Woods Show. There are so many goodies you get. I'm telling you, you're depriving yourself by not grabbing them. So head over to supportinglisteners.com, and I will see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.